I am not excited for Dawn Trail. It feels underwhelming to me for a lot of different reasons, but most of them are story based. So in this video, I'm going to break down my predictions for how I think Dawn Trail's story is going to go and why I think the idea of this X-Pack that I've made up in my head will probably disappoint me. And it's not just because Waklama is already grating on my nerves. As always, these are just my opinions. And if I've learned anything from 10 years of playing this game, it's that they always do find some way to surprise me. And I definitely think that Endwalker is a really, really tough act to follow, which is where a lot of my uncertainty about Dawn Trail and the continuation of the Final Fantasy XIV storyline comes from. They did not have an easy job deciding where to go after that, and I respect that they're continuing to try, and to give us a new story anyway. So just consider me playing the devil's advocate here, okay? Just to note, this will probably contain minor spoilers up until the 6.55 patch quest. Nothing major, but I will touch on subjects mentioned within those quests and especially with the plot of Endwalker, so keep that in mind if you haven't caught up yet. Okay, with that out of the way, let's start off with my conveniently internet-friendly numbered list, with probably my most controversial take. Number 1. The Characters I'm just gonna say it. <sighs> I'm sick of the Scions! Look, we've had five entire story arcs with them. Five full campaigns where all the Scions go through at least three different character arcs each. That's a lot of character development, but how much is too much character development? Is it narratively satisfying to watch these characters long after it feels like they've already reached the climax of their own personal stories? I don't really think so. Let's take Yishtola for example. I like her a lot, so don't come for me in the comments, but how many times has she had the dies but not really arc? At least twice. Thancred too, after his huge character-defining moment in Shadowbringers where the camera pans up and out over his body laying in the ground, and then he just kind of walks right back to the group slightly banged up like nothing really happened. Alfino too has grown as a person a lot since Heavensward, but it feels like the climax of his arc was all the way back in Heavensward, and we've been following him through his falling action ever since. But he never really gets to reach that satisfying conclusion to his character. He just starts on a new arc and continues along. It just isn't satisfying from a narrative sense to have characters constantly go through these ups and downs, because there's only so many times you can repeat the same arc of Graha learns to love himself and have adventures and gets to eat food before it just starts to become repetitive or at worst a boring slice of life episode. And I love Graha. I want him to eat as much food as he wants. But there's only so much I want to watch him rehash the exact same development that he's already had. It starts to lose its impact. And I get it, these are our main characters. We can't kill them off, we can't get rid of them. They're the Scions. But... They aren't anymore. Number 2. Endwalker was supposed to be the end. <laughs> The entire point of Endwalker was meant to end a storyline that began in ARR, the Hydaelyn vs Zodiark saga. That's something that Yoshi P himself said. The Scions even made a huge deal of disbanding at the end of Endwalker. There was a whole cutscene about it, like dramatic with flashbacks and everything. But did they really disband? They all still work together. We can still call on them if we need them. Sure, some of the minor characters that never really did much of anything since ARR that were just sort of hanging around the Rising Stones might be gone. But what about our main characters, the ones that it was supposed to actually be impactful for? I, I know it was just meant to be kind of like a statement piece, like the Scions are still all secretly working together. They just aren't the Scions anymore, but what's the point of that? To fool the rest of the world? To get rid of the random side characters like Hori Boulder? Who cares about them? As a narrative arc, it feels really unsatisfying to make such a big deal out of disbanding the Scions, only to walk it back like three quests later in the 6.1 patch quests. At some point in development, they said that Dawn Trail was supposed to be a jumping on point for new players, because it's like kind of a lot to expect someone to go through hundreds of hours of story content just to reach endgame as a new player. And Final Fantasy XIV has an amazing story. It's one of the best I've ever experienced in a video game, and it's definitely worth playing. But it can also be a huge wall for new players to overcome, especially if you just want to start playing and try the game out with your friends for the new X-Pack. If someone were to buy a skip to Dawn Trail, they would still be completely lost. They wouldn't know who any of the characters are, and more importantly, they wouldn't have the investment to care. 
but the story, obviously, is going to treat them like the Scions are your best friends that you've been through so much with. And no amount of new characters they introduce is going to keep that from happening. Which brings me to point number three. Character bloat. There are just way too many main characters at this point. And I know what you're thinking. Well, Iska, the solution to the problem that you just presented of having these characters repeat their arcs so many times that they become boring is to introduce new characters and to have new arcs instead. So what's your problem? And yeah, I agree with that. But then, what are the Scions doing there? Just hanging around in the background, doing nothing like little hanger-ons? What narrative purpose do they serve by being there and coming along with us again? Keeping the Scions with us adds to another growing problem that this game has. There are simply way too many characters to keep track of. What I wanted out of Dawn Trail was a clean slate to start with. A whole new continent with whole new characters to join up with and learn the personalities of. Even if I don't really like them. And I guess it's asking too much to totally wipe it all clean because people might not be as invested in the new characters, but by keeping all the old characters there, you make it hard for people to really invest in the new characters or give them a chance. Why care about Green Catboy when Red Catboy already exists and has so much development with you? Switching to a new cast of characters for every arc is how a game like Genshin Impact gets its players invested in the new characters. They have a huge cast, like huge, but they rotate the characters per region. And sure, there might be some cross-region interactions between the characters, but that's usually just in events or as like a kind of cameo appearance. And if any game has perfected the art of getting people invested in characters, it's Genshin Impact. I just feel like Dawn Trail would feel more like a unique experience if they let the Scions sit off to the side for a little while. And they don't have to get rid of them either. Giving each Scion their own little side quest or something would be like a good way to keep them in the game, while still letting the new characters have the spotlight for a while. But hey, maybe that's what they'll do in Dawn Trail. The Scions are apparently going to be like against each other or something, right? Number 4, The Scion Civil War Yeah, yeah, I have an issue with this too, even though I will admit that splitting the party, as this seems to be, will probably help a lot with the issue of character bloat that I mentioned already. However, based off the end of the Endwalker's patch cycle quests, I'm pretty sure the competition that is going to pit the Scions against each other that was so hyped up is just going to be a competition to put someone else on the throne. But with the way this competition was pitched to us in the story so far, it seems like letting the new Hrothgar girl win the throne is the only way to keep them from attacking Garlemald and starting up another war or something. Isn't that objectively the correct choice? Why would the other Scions want to jeopardize that? It doesn't make a lot of sense to me, even if they've been hired by someone else to try and win the throne or something, because it just doesn't seem like something that should put the Scions against each other. They also want to protect Eorzea. Why would Thancred and Uriange suddenly be like, yeah, fuck Garlemald after all they went through? That being said, I don't think any competition between the Scions is going to be all that intense. Maybe they're all just as sick of each other as I am or something, but it would take a lot for them to like genuinely go against each other in any kind of meaningful way. I'm sure that the side the other Scions will be on will inevitably be just against the war as Waklamat is. Friendly competition is fun and all, but it does make the stakes of the X-Pack a little bit low, which is kind of an issue itself. Number 5. Jumping the Shark Endwalker, by textbook definition, Jump the Shark the stakes of Endwalker were ridiculous and world-ending and catastrophic and profoundly emotional, and it's going to make every other threat feel minuscule by comparison. Dawn Trail is the beginning of a whole new storyline for the game, separate from the Zodiac vs. Heidelin storyline, and by virtue of that, it's going to feel a little bit slow and like there aren't any serious stakes yet. So for the sake of telling another multiple x back storyline, it should be all rising action with more grounded issues before we can start to go off and kill God or the personification of despair or whatever again. But even if I can acknowledge the reason why Dawn Trail stakes need to be much lower than what we've been used to, it isn't helping me feel excited to play it. Following Endwalker is a really tough job, and I don't envy the writers behind this story because they had to figure out a way to make everything feel climactic in the moment, but not immediately jump to world-ending dramatics. As much as I admit that the idea of lower stakes kind of bores me, I do think that Dawn Trail should be the beginning of a new storyline for the game, and that they don't think that they need to immediately one-up the stakes in Endwalker. Some huge, universe-ending threat right off the bat to try and match the stakes of Endwalker will just end up feeling flat and forced and honestly a little bit exhausting. 
like we're dramatic world ending plot fatigued. Can't we just have a nice vacation for once? Which leads me right into my next issue and subsequent prediction. Number six, leave the Asians alone already. Now, I'm as much an Asian fucker as the next, but they pitched Dontrail as a new arc, something totally unrelated to the Heidelin and Zodiac and the Asians in the Convocation in the Final Days, and I really hope that they stick with this. I want a new threat, a new enemy to face, and a new storyline to follow, with new mysteries that we haven't already solved yet, not just another rehash of the same Asians who are so sad because they blew up their original universe into 14 shards. Like, I joke, but honestly, the Heidelin vs. Zodiac storyline of Final Fantasy XIV was one of the best story writing I have ever experienced in a video game ever. It was emotional and deep and profound, and the messages really, really spoke to me. And I guess I just hate the idea of that being lessened or cheapened because they can't let the ancients go. Unfortunately for that, Yoshi P has already said that we should remember all the names of the Convocation members in preparation for Dawn Trail's story. People are already predicting that this girl is one of the Convocation members that we don't have any real information on yet. Pashtorot is the most common theory I've seen thrown around for her because the like little thing at her hip kind of resembles the Pashtorot symbol or whatever. But as much as I really hope this isn't the case, it seems like it might be true. I think it's pretty likely that she's one of the Sundered Asians of the Convocation, most likely Pasturat, and probably woken up by Emmett Selk like Amon slash Fandaniel was in the Allegan Empire. But speaking of Emmett Selk, let's talk villains. Number 7. Villains No matter if you like them or if you hate them, it's hard to deny that the villains have really been the standout characters of each X-Pack. Emmet Selk literally tops the charts as the most popular villain in all of Final Fantasy history, and Xenos has a huge, rabid fanbase of diehard supporters. Gaius, arguably the main villain of ARR, is also so popular that they brought him back to redeem him in a full side quest story arc and give him a daughter. And you know, his iconic line, Such devastation, this was not my intention. So far, Final Fantasy XIV has a really good track record with making even the most irredeemable villain have motives and find a way for you to sympathize with them. But we're starting totally fresh now. I think it's also likely that this enigmatic maiden will be the main new villain of this X-Pack. And so far, we've seen with Yotsuyu that Final Fantasy can write women as ruthless villains, but they don't have the best track record of sticking the landing very well. My personal prediction for this enigmatic maiden is a combination of stuff that I've heard. I think she'll be an Asian woken up like Amon into Fan Daniel, but no matter if she's a Garlean or an Allegan princess or whatever else she might be, I think she's in charge of the virtual reality that makes up Solution 9, possibly even the creator of it. Because this place is definitely some kind of virtual reality, right? It's the only place that I'm even a little bit excited for because unlike the other areas that we've been shown in the previews and in the patch notes, it isn't just a generic tropical forest, and it looks completely different from any other area we've encountered before in the game. Solution 9 is most likely one of two things. The ninth shard solution to some kind of calamity that didn't happen, maybe whatever Asian the Enigmatic Maiden is had a change of heart or something after uh, whatever catastrophic event happened on the ninth shard, and in order to prevent it from rejoining and causing a calamity, she created a virtual reality to stuff everybody into in order to save them. Or, Solution 9 is the 12th's ninth, the 12th's ninth solution to saving people from dying in the calamity that collapsed the 12th shard into Heidelin by similarly stuffing them into a virtual reality. Also probably done by Pastrat, who may have grown attached to the people she was trying to manipulate or something, and then that's why she's still running this simulation as the Enigmatic Maiden. Or maybe she's got some kind of god complex, that might be fun. The second option is a little bit more likely based on what we know because they put a lot of emphasis on the amount of lightning energy in the area, and the 12th shard was notably flooded with lightning to cause the second calamity. But both ideas are essentially the same. From what we've seen of this character so far, I think she might end up a lot more sympathetic than not. And that's fine and great and all, but it doesn't really fill the void that Xenos left behind. I'll fully admit that that part is entirely my own personal preference though. Let's return to Solution 9 for a moment. So, if it's not the 9th shard, and it's more likely the 12th shard, why is it called Solution 9? Why name it Solution 9? Are there 8 prior solutions? Will those matter at all? 
Was nine just an arbitrary number that they chose? Why put all the emphasis on the number nine? Number seven, please stop referencing other Final Fantasy games. Please, I am begging you. I am literally on my knees. Please do not base an entire x -Pax plot around a pre-existing Final Fantasy game. I can put up with the references, I can put up with the side quests and the side content like the weapon trial quest line or the enemies being themed after the enemies from the previous Final Fantasy games or the Crystal Tower or whatever, fine, whatever. But the worst part of Dawn Trail's MSQ patch quest content and one of the reasons why I checked out so hard is that like, I never played Final Fantasy 4. I feel absolutely nothing for Final Fantasy 4 and seeing enemies or characters or whatever from it, and as soon as it's obvious that Final Fantasy 14 is starting to jerk off one of the other games, my brain just checks right out. And yes, I know they've been doing this from the start. I know that the Crystal Tower is a reference to Final Fantasy 3, I know that Kryle and the entire Eureka storyline and most of the game's enemies are references to other Final Fantasy games too. I know that most of the side content is a reference to other Final Fantasy games. But... There's a difference between references and just wholesale taking characters from one game and shoving them in where they don't belong. Golbez being Golbez and it being a big reveal or whatever made absolutely no sense to me because I've never played Final Fantasy IV and I don't really care. Just leaning on the fact that, ooh, it's Golbez and his little fiendy guys made the story matter less to me because I don't know who Golbez is outside of the context that they presented him to me in. And to me, he's just like this random giant suit of armor that appeared out of nowhere. Like I think Zero was right not to trust him. I started caring a little bit later once they started to reveal his Final Fantasy XIV related backstory and once they gave him a significantly better boss design, but by then it was just too late and I was already pulled out of the immersion by going, oh, he's a thing from another Final Fantasy game and checking out for like three patch cycles. I know they're going to continue to put the rest of the Final Fantasy franchise into 14, and I'm not saying that they shouldn't just because I don't care about Final Fantasy as a franchise, but they at least need to put some effort into making an actual story that isn't just, hey, remember this thing you used to like? Remember? Remember it? And no, I, I don't think they'll do this for Dawn Trail. But I've heard multiple people saying that, duh, it's called Solution 9 because Dawn Trail is going to be the Final Fantasy 9 X-Pack and it's going to pull all of its story themes and whatever else from Final Fantasy 9 and that just kind of bums me out. It doesn't excite me to hear that there's a possibility that all Dawn Trail is going to be is characters pointing in a direction and going, remember Final Fantasy 9? Remember this from Final Fantasy 9? Wasn't it so awesome? I do have faith that Dawn Trail's writers won't do that, but the Endwalker patch quest really haven't helped me be less wary about how many references are going to be used as a crutch in Dawn Trail. Final Fantasy XIV is at its absolute best when they are writing their own original material, and I guess my hope is that I want to see more of that, even if it was just more Asians if I had to pick between the two. So that's why I'm not super excited for Dawn Trail. And I do fully expect them to surprise me. I've tried to predict most X-Packs with various bingo cards and prediction sheets, and while I've got a pretty good track record, I'm definitely not always right. The writing team between Final Fantasy XIV is full of very talented writers, and they're really doing their best with what they've been given, even if what they've been given is just a pile of other Final Fantasy games. I guess at the end of the day, I just think it's going to be really difficult to follow Endwalker and the massive eight-year-long story that led up to it. And that's okay. I really want to have faith in Yoshi P and the team behind Dawn Trail because they've come up with some of the most beautifully written stories I have ever experienced in a game. And that's a lot to live up to. And story aside, there will be a lot of pretty cool improvements in Dawn Trail. The graphics update is something I've been really excited for and it'll make future replays of the game and re-experiencing the story that much better. And there are a whole bunch of quality of life improvements that'll continue to make the game easier and less clunky to play. Who knows, maybe the Dragoon rework will finally make it not a horrible mess to play even though I'm already annoyed that they took away the damage on the jumps. And if I'm totally wrong about all of this and Dawn Trail's story blows me out of the water, maybe I'll make a follow-up video. I'm not too proud to admit when I'm wrong, okay? Anyway, I think that overall Dawn Trail will be fine. Nothing outstanding, just an acceptable expansion and the beginning of a new arc. Just, you know. Don't, don't be like me and keep your expectations low. 
Remember to like and subscribe if you want to see my embarrassing follow-up video about Dawn Trail being awesome. Okay, thanks for watching. Bye!